Good afternoon, everybody. It's one o'clock. I guess we can give like a couple of minutes for everyone to get ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the April 2018 Communicable Disease Forum webinar. My name is Sharif Ibrahim. I am the program manager for the regional, for the regional epidemiologist program. Today, as always, uh, today's webinar is being recorded and archived. Uh, it will be posted to the New Jersey Department of Health website. Uh, today, uh, CEUs uh, are provided to public health and nursing credits. Credits will be provided to those who, will at who attend the webinar live. You also must be registered on GoToWebinar and NJLMN to be eligible for credits. Please note that uh, those viewing the webinar in the archived version are not eligible to receive CEUs. All attendees, uh, the lines will be muted. Please use the question uh, icons to uh, and type your questions and will be answered at the end of the webinar if time permits. Handouts may be accessed in the handout box. Handouts on uh, GoToWebinar will be available only during the live uh, webinar. Uh, you can also access the handout uh, in uh, New Jersey LMN in Practice Exchange. After the webinar, you will receive a link to the evaluation. Uh, it will be sent to your email uh, registered at NJLMN. Those who are seeking CEUs must complete the evaluation form uh, in five days after, within five days after receiving the link. Remember that the evaluation link will close after five days. After the evaluation close, certificates will be emailed to the address listed in NJLMN for nurses and attendance will be verif verified in NJLMN for public health professionals. Those who do not complete the evaluation will not receive credits. Reminder, which I just, I will, I will repeat what I just said again. So you must be registered on both GoToWebinar and NJLMN. Link to evaluation will be emailed to you in your email that's registered with NJLMN. Complete the evaluation for CEUs. Certificates for nurses will be emailed after evaluation closes. Attendance will be verified for licensed public health professionals. Once webinar, uh, the webinar is posted to the NJDOH, we will um, send you a notification email. Uh, some uh, interesting trainings and webinars and conferences that you might be interested to attend. Uh, on May 2nd, uh, from 9.30 to 11.30, New Jersey Public uh, Recreation and Bathing New Regulations Webinar 
there is no credits. You can register at the webinar uh, ID number shown on the screen. May 22nd, uh, tick borne disease. Uh, what New Jersey public health professional uh, know? That's from 10 to 11. Uh, it's free. Public health credit will be provided. Register online at NJLMN. The link and the webinar ID are shown on the screen. June 12th, that's our next, uh, no, that's not June 12th. June 12th is the annual NJ Drug Diversion Conference, responding to drug diversion in healthcare setting at Rutger University. They provide all e CMEs, CNEs, all the CEs, and uh, you have to pay $50 for participation. You can register in the link shown on the screen. July 12, that's our next CD forum or communicable disease forum, and you will have free attendance, free nursing and public health credits. Registration is open at GoToWebinar, and the webinar ID is shown again on the screen. Uh, good things to look forward uh, on the fall. You, uh, should be, you should stay tuned for in-person communicable disease forum and in-person long-term care facility training. This is the agenda for today. I think you, hopefully you had a chance to look at it. We have great speakers and great topics. I will just go ahead with some updates from different programs at the Communicable Disease Service. First, I'll start with our program and regional AP programs. I am glad to announce uh, that uh, we have a new regional AP joined our program. Uh, her name is Brett Nance, MPH, and she has completed her uh, uh, master's degree from Rutgers University. She will be working in the southern region covering uh, Camden, uh, Gloucester, Cumberland, and Salem counties. Additionally, a regional AP program is on the process of hiring two more uh, regional epidemiologists. Uh, I guess we, you've been waiting to hear that update for a while now. Uh, I know uh, all of us are sick and tired of influenza, that's 2017-2018 influenza season, and this update provided by uh, my colleagues at uh, the influenza uh, group as of 4 or April 7, 18. The influenza season this year peaked at uh, or in mid-February. Influenza AH3 was the most uh, predominant viral strain. Uh, 51 severe pediatric influenza case, uh, cases reported and three influenza pediatric deaths reported. 183 respiratory outbreak or outbreaks reported on long-term care facilities. Emergency department visits and admission uh, or hospital admission were higher than uh, the 2012-2013 and 2014-15 uh, seasons, which were the last two significant influenza AH3 seasons. As seasonal influenza declines, uh, the summer comes and comes with it more novel uh, viruses that circulate. So it is important to continue to be vigilant for unusual respiratory illnesses during the coming months. Next update from uh, our group, Infection Control Assessment, uh, ICAR group. Uh, first, I start with the good news that the ICAR activities will be extended for another uh, year, ending in March 2019. Uh, the ICAR team will continue to recruit facilities for assessment, focusing on long-term care facilities. Any interested facilities can contact the ICAR team at the email and number shown on the screen. You can also get more information on their website shown at the bottom of the slide. Next update from uh, waterborne disease or Legionella. Uh, resources keeping Legionella out of water systems in buildings is a key to preventing infections. Water management programs have been established as an industry best practice for building water systems including healthcare facilities. 
in the United States. For more information about water management programs, visit the CDC websites and uh, look at the toolkit at the link provided on the slide. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, released a memorandum that mandate CMS certified healthcare facilities to have water management policies and procedures to reduce the risk of growth and spread of Legionella and other opportunistic pathogens in buildings uh, water system. For more information, visit the CMS website provided on the screen. Still with Legionella, just a reminder, the peak season for Legionellosis is approaching on summer and early fall. All Legionellosis case patients should be interviewed to determine exposures during their incubation periods. A hypothesis generating questionnaire can be used when investigating single cases of Legionellosis to collect additional epidemiologic data. Please visit the uh, link on the screen to uh, access the questionnaire. Information should be entered into each CDRSS cases or case, and this information helps to detect both local and travel associated clusters and outbreaks. Next updates from uh, hepatitis, uh, our hepatitis colleagues, hepatitis C surveillance reminders. Any new cases involving dialysis are high risk for seroconversion. These require investigation to determine if the case was already HCV positive before starting dialysis. If you receive a verbal report or CDS-17 that states that the case has a negative HCV NAT or a prior negative HCV antibody, please request a hard copy for that lab report for confirmation. Signs and symptoms, notification, education, risk factors do not get picked up from the comment tab. Those need to be placed in the drop down boxes to be counted. Always start with person search for potential prior cases uh, to avoid duplications. The link provided in the screen uh, take you to the guidance document and webinar slides for your references. Next update from a uh, multi-drug resistance organism or, or own multi-drug resistant organism from our healthcare associated infection team. Uh, the New Jersey Department of Health is seeking labs to submit the following isolates for antimicrobial resistance mechanism testing. So we're looking forward basically the carpapenem resistance Klebsiella pneumoniae or CRE and carpapenem resistance pseudomonas. Please contact Patricia Barrett and her email is at uh, the bottom of the slides if you uh, would like to submit islets. Good news, if you are interested in antibiotic stewardship training, uh, there is opportunity coming from CDC. Uh, the CDC has released the first of four training modules on antibiotic stewardship. All four modules provided or provide free continuous education credits for, again, all the CEs, CME, CNE, CEU, CE, CH, uh, et cetera. If you would like to register, please go through the link uh, provided at the screen. Uh, last update, I believe, for me is the Vaccine Preventable Disease Program and this update on measles. Uh, we have one confirmed case of measles in New Jersey in 2018, five measles cases uh, were reported, investigated, uh, four reports were ruled out. Measles exposure occur at many locations throughout the United States, including exposures of New Jersey residents. NJ Link's messages sent on January 12 were with Newark Airport exposure 314, Newark Airport 327, multiple states, April 3rd, April 24th with New York State exposure. Multiple measles flight notifications, seven flights that mandates to uh, 50 uh, or mandate notification of 57 passengers who were exposed. 
13 additional New Jersey residents identified as exposed in other jurisdictions. Please remain vigilant for cases of measles. Consider measles in any patient with fever and rash, and stress the importance of receiving immunization before, uh, especially before international travel. For more additional resources on measles, please follow the link provided at the screen. Next is a very interesting update that you are all, all waiting for is uh, uh, E. coli 0157. Uh, and I will let uh, my colleague uh, DPAM uh, Thomas, uh, our foodborne coordinator, to present this update for you. Thanks, Sheree, for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deepam Thomas. I'm the Foodborne Disease Surveillance Coordinator with CDS. Uh, and today I'm going to give you a quick update on the most recent multi-state foodborne outbreak of E. coli 015787 infections linked to romaine lettuce. But first, just a quick background. So every year, approximately 265,000 STEC cases get reported nationally, with approximately 254 cases in New Jersey. And as most of you know, there are over 200 different recognized stack serotypes that are primarily distinguished by their major surface antigens, so the O and H. Non-0157 stack serogroups typically cause less severe illnesses and include 0145, 026, 011, etc. But most outbreaks happen with 0157. The most common modes of transmission are contaminated food, contaminated water, exposure to animals or their environment, person to person, and of course, risky food, like unpasteurized milk or juice, inadequately cooked meat. And the incubation period for STEC is typically three to four days after exposure, with a range of a minimum of one to a maximum of 10 days. Clinical features include abdominal pain, which can be very severe, vomiting, and bloody diarrhea, and some cases could develop HUS, or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Testing, case definitions, and investigation. We typically see CIDTs, or culture independent diagnostic testing, PCR, and cultures reported from labs for STEC. All STEC 0157 isolates and specimens or enrichment broths in which sugar toxin or sugar toxin producing E. coli are detected by clinical labs and they should be forwarded to NGDOH FEL or the state lab for confirmation, isolation, and additional characterization. So for cases to be part of a multi-state cluster, the isolates or enrich enrichment broths would always have to be first confirmed by the state lab and then further matched by PFG. And in some cases, additional whole genome sequencing testing is performed by CDC. We follow CFC case definition. So currently there are three case definitions that are being used to classify cases in CDRSS, but none of these change case investigations. So if E. coli 015787 is isolated from a case, that case becomes a confirmed STEC case. A case is probable if E. coli 0157 is isolated from a clinical specimen without the confirmation of H antigen or sugar toxin production or if the case is a clinically compatible case and epi-linked to a STEC case. Finally, a case is considered possible if the person received a diagnosis of post-diarrheal HUS or if sugar toxin was identified in a specimen from a clinically compatible case without the isolation of STEC. So now let's move on to the update that everyone has been waiting for, the multi-state E. coli outbreak. So it all began when we were notified on a Thursday before Easter weekend of three cases of STEC that an astute ICP and a local health department had followed up on. All three cases were presumptive positive, all three mentioned salads, and all three mentioned Panera, but different locations. For about a week before this notification, we had been monitoring an increase in STEC cases compared to last year. And as you all know, in 2017, 
a new stack case report form, CDS 40, was created to capture all relevant exposures. This form has been well liked both by CDC and our investigators, and it's all your timely interviews that were completed and promptly returned that helped us to quickly identify cases even before lab testing could link them. Between our first notification on 3.29 and April 3rd, six tech cases were identified with three separate Panera locations. On April 2nd, we informed CDC and neighboring states of the increase and the commonalities, but no one else was seeing similar patterns. So we prioritized interviews, added a leafy green supplemental, and expedited testing at the <coughs> state lab. By April 4th, thanks to our hardworking public health partners, we had already performed Panera Cafe inspections, gathered invoices, and had picked up product for testing from one of the cafes, which unfortunately or fortunately came back negative. By April 5th, Pennsylvania informed us of two of their cases that had similar exposures, and CDC assigned this investigation a cluster code. A CDC FDA multi-state call was set up for April 9th. And based on all the information that we were able to gather, while we were able to quickly rule out Panera, we were also able to successfully narrow it down to romaine lettuce and the Yuma region. And this was just within one week of our initial notification. But additional testing and interviewing would be needed for confirmation. So in such outbreak scenarios, we always work very, very closely with CDC for consistent messaging. And we encourage all local health departments to work closely with us to ensure that that consistent messaging is continued. So this is the progression that you can see. By April 10th, there were 17 people that had been reported from seven states. And while all, all of our New Jersey cases had exposure information, pointing to a common product, our cases had also eaten other leafy greens and had shopped or eaten them from other stores and restaurants, just like cases from other states. Additional information still needed to be gathered to confirm the source of infections. By April 13th, there were 35 cases in 11 states and the outbreak had now been linked to chopped romaine lettuce from Yuma, Arizona. By April 18th, 18 more people were added, and the case count rose to 53 in 16 states. However, on April 20th, with cases in an Alaskan correctional facility being linked to whole heads of romaine lettuce, the warning was now expanded and remains to remain from all the winter growing regions of Yuma, Arizona. This slide includes a summary of the New Jersey cases that are part of the multi-state cluster. So we have a total of seven confirmed cases, and these have all been matched by PFG. Four counties involved. The median age for our cases is 46. The illness onsets range from March 15th to March 26th. Six out of seven of our cases are white and female. Six of them were hospitalized. One was diagnosed with HUS but thankfully all of our six hospitalized cases have recovered and have been discharged. All seven, 100% of our cases, reported eating romaine lettuce in the week before illness onset. As of yesterday, April 25th, we are up to 84 cases nationwide that match by PFG. So the, more, the map is more colored that you can see on the screen, but 96, percent of our interviewed cases still mention romaine lettuce. A common grower, a supplier or distributor, or even a brand of romaine lettuce has not been identified. However, such quick traceback rarely happens with a product like lettuce that moves so quickly. This is where the timely investigation, as soon as a case has been identified, a food has history that has been captured with minimum recall bias as close to the illness onset becomes invaluable. The unique exposures gathered could help us crack the investigation, help accelerate the trace back, and most importantly, help issue warnings so that more illnesses could be prevented. As we move into summer and the cluster season, 
I'd like to remind everyone to complete case report forms, not just for STEC, but for all foodborne illnesses. Document your exposures in CDRSS, and please be on the lookout for a links message with updated links to case report forms. I would also like to once again stress the importance of consistent messaging in outbreak scenarios. And of course, thank all of you for the great job that you're doing with foodborne illness investigations. Thank you. Thanks, Dibam. This is great update. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Kim uh, Cervantes, and the topic is Itching for a Mosquito Update, a Victor Born Disease Program. Thanks, Sharif. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, kind of hard to follow on Deepam's interesting uh, outbreak presentation, but I will do my best. Uh, let's see. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of how vector-borne disease surveillance is conducted in New Jersey and uh, the surveillance reports that we produce throughout the season. Do we have an issue? Oh, keep rolling. Okay. Um, I'm also gonna talk about arboviral diseases that affect New Jersey or that have the potential to affect us, areas to focus on when investing cases and how those fields will display in CDRSS and then arboviral uh, testing resources for clinicians. Slides are frozen. I don't know what the oh. issue is. Uh, apparently the slides are frozen. Do we want to take a minute? Okay. All right. I'm gonna. Um, all right. So I'm gonna keep going. Hopefully the slides will uh, will come back in just uh, just a minute. Yeah. So, um, can anyone write in the comment box? Are you what in terms of what you're seeing right now? You should be seeing a slide with a bunch of circles on it and a mosquito. Are you getting any comments? Okay. You're seeing it. They are. Okay. Okay. Great. It's just not working uh, on our side, so that's okay. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna talk with a, a little overview of our surveillance partners. So starting at the top of the circle, uh, the health department and the communicable disease service specifically cha uh, chairs an interagency vector-borne disease working group to coordinate preparedness, surveillance, and response activities. We disseminate a statewide vector-borne disease surveillance report for partners. Uh, the report describes our vector-borne disease activity by county and over time. And of course, the health department also provides education and training. Uh, CDS also represents public health on the State Mosquito Control Commission. We work with local health departments who lead investigations of vector-borne disease cases and who also provide patient and provider education. And we work with our lab to provide uh, testing for vector-borne diseases in people, birds, and mosquitoes. The State Mosquito Control Commission was uh, established in 1956. It's staffed by the Office of Mosquito Control Coordination, which is located at the Department of Environmental Protection. And the commission is responsible for monitoring mosquito control activities throughout the state and making recommendations to the governor as well as the state legislature. Uh, DEP is also the liaison with the county mosquito control agencies who are responsible for implementing integrated pest management programs in all of New Jersey counties. And the commission also funds the Rutgers Center for Vector Biology who conducts vector surveillance, research, and mapping. The New Jersey Department of Agriculture provides uh, testing in horses, livestock, and wildlife. Um, they're also represented on the State Mosquito Control Commission and the Vector-Borne Disease Working Group. And New Jersey also has two very active professional organizations, the Associated Executives of Mosquito Control Work and the New Jersey Mosquito Control Association. Okay, so we're gonna try a poll question. Um, the question is, um, how often, uh, 
Oh, wait. Okay. Okay. Question is, how often did you look at the um, health department's weekly vector-borne disease surveillance report last summer? So A, it was the highlight of my week. You wouldn't miss it. Uh, B, often but not always. C, occasionally. D, never. And E, wait, there's a weekly report. So please uh, enter your response. Okay, so at least I, I'm, I'm heartened to know that uh, the majority of you have are at least familiar with the report and, and are occasionally looking at it, and, and that, that's wonderful. Um, so for, for those of you who are interested in knowing how the vector-borne season is going, um, similar to the influenza surveillance report that's produced in the winter months, the uh, CDS produces the vector-borne disease surveillance report in the summer and early fall months. It's shown on the screen here in the upper left. And uh, these reports include data on vector-borne diseases in humans, mosquitoes, and animals. They're available for download on our website under statistics, reports, and publications. And I've included the link on the slide. If you would be like, if you would like to be added to our email distribution list so that you would get this personally in your email uh, inbox every week, you can send me an email, and my email address will be at the end, and we will certainly add you onto that list. The Rutgers Center for Vector Biology also produces weekly surveillance reports uh, on vector-borne disease activity and on adult mosquito populations. Um, both of these reports focus uh, heavily on the different species of mosquitoes. And those reports are available online as well, and I've included the link there. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, arboviral diseases that uh, are impacting New Jersey or that have the potential. There's over 500 registered arboviruses, but not all cause human disease. Some have a global distribution like dengue, and others have a distinct geographic range. Uh, West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis, or Triple E, are the two arboviral diseases we consider endemic in New Jersey. Um, I'll also talk about travel-associated diseases we've been dealing with over the past couple years, chikungunya, dengue, and Zika, and uh, some emerging or potential concerns um, as well. So starting with West Nile virus. Um, West Nile virus is a flavivirus. It's the most commonly reported endemic arboviral disease in both the United States and in New Jersey. Uh, most people who are infected have no symptoms. Of those that do, they're uh, very general, nonspecific, and they can resemble many other illnesses. Symptoms often are mild, and as such, people will not go to seek medical care. They may not be tested, so milder cases tend to be underreported. About one in 150 people infected will present with severe neuroinvasive illness, including encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, or meningitis, uh, inflammation of the membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord. Severe illness can occur in people of any age, uh, but people over the age of 60 and those with underlying medical conditions are at greatest risk. And recovery can take several weeks or months. Um, some neurological effects may be permanent, and one in 10 persons with that severe presentation um, affecting the central nervous system will die of their illness. The chart on the left shows the annual incidence of West Nile virus neuroinvasive disease cases from 1999, when West Nile was first reported, through 2016. And these are national statistics. Um, you can see that West Nile activity sort of ebbs and flows, uh, but after four consecutive years of low activity uh, between 2008 and 2011, over 5,000 cases reported in 2012, which was the second highest number ever reported. The map shows the incidence of neuroinvasive disease by state for 2017, um, and any 2017 data in the presentation should be cons uh, considered preliminary. And even though West Nile is the most commonly reported arboviral disease in New Jersey, you can see from the map that uh, New Jersey and the Mid-Atlantic region in general has a much lower incidence of West Nile 
as compared to the central and western parts of the country. This map is showing a 10-year incident rate for West Nile virus cases by county in New Jersey. Uh, the highest incident rates are in the central and southern parts of the state, with the highest rates in Camden, shown in black, um, and then the purple-colored um, counties of Camden, Gloucester, Salem, Cumberland, and Cape May. And uh, interestingly, there were no human cases of West Nile virus reported in Sussex or Warren counties over the 10-year period. The map on the right shows our West Nile virus activity for 2017. Uh, the shaded counties are the number of positive mosquito pools. The human cases are noted with a red star and positive horses are shown in the blue circles. Uh, in 2017, there were eight human cases reported in New Jersey. The average age was 64, uh, ranging from 41 to 80. Uh, six out of the eight cases were hospitalized with a neuroinvasive presentation most often encephalitis, and those individuals were quite ill with an average length of uh, stay in the hospital of 15 days, uh, with many of them needing rehabilitation services uh, before being able to be discharged to home, and uh, two of the cases died. Uh, moving on to Tripoli, the other endemic arbovirus. Uh, so Tripoli is an alpha virus. It's maintained in a cycle between Culicida melanora mosquitoes and avian hosts in freshwater hardwood swamps. Uh, Culicida melanora is thought not to be an important vector of Tripoli virus uh, transmission to humans because it feeds almost exclusively on birds. Uh, although some recent studies have suggested that uh, the mosquito may play a larger role in human transmission. So transmission to people is usually facilitated by mosquito species capable of creating a bridge between the infected birds and uninfected mammals and include different mosquito species, including some Aedes, Cochatidia, and Culex species. Human illness with Tripoli is rare, um, largely because the primary transmission cycle takes place in and around swampy areas where human populations tend to be limited. There's an average of seven cases of Tripoli reported in the United States each year. Most cases have been reported from Florida, Massachusetts, New York, and North Carolina. And prior to 2016, New Jersey last reported a human case 13 years before in 2003. Horses are also susceptible to Tripoli. Most cases are fatal. And both horses and humans are considered to be dead-end hosts for the virus, um, similar to West Nile, which means that the concentration of virus in the bloodstream is usually insufficient to infect mosquitoes. While most Tripoli infections are asymptomatic, uh, four to five percent will manifest as a severe encephalitic presentation. Tripoli is one of the most severe mosquito transmitted diseases in the United States with a 33 percent mortality rate and significant brain damage in most survivors. Uh, the map is showing the distribution of the seven cases reported in 2016. With the exception of Montana, cases were reported from states that have historically reported uh, Tripoli uh, virus. And the Montana case was exposed in another state that did have previously documented transmission. All seven cases were neuroinvasive presentations, the majority with encephalitis, the median age was 63, and 57 percent of cases were over the age of 60. Six out of seven cases were male, and the onset dates ranged between July and October. All seven cases were hospitalized, and three out of the seven, or 43 percent of them, died. Uh, the number of human cases is, is almost certainly underestimating the true burden of disease. People who are asymptomatic or who have milder illness are likely not reported, and even with a severe presentation, testing for Tripoli is not available commercially. So clinicians need to suspect Tripoli, and they need to know how to contact public health for testing. Um, since it is such a rarely reported disease, it's uh, likely not high on the list of a differential diagnosis. Historically, uh, in New Jersey, we have seen Tripoli activity mostly in the southern and central east parts of the state. The map on the left shows the areas where we typically test mosquito pools for Tripoli shaded in blue. The map on the right shows Tripoli activity for 2016. Middlesex County, shown in pink, uh, just north of where we typically sample, had three Tripoli positive Culicida melanora pools. 
three out of our four positive horse cases were in the northern part of the state. Two in Morris County were located less than five miles apart and had onset dates two weeks apart. Uh, a third horse was in Passaic County, even further north. New Jersey reported a human case in 2016 of fatality in a male in his 50s from Passaic County. He developed symptoms on September 30th and Tripoli virus was identified by PCR on brain tissue at autopsy. Both Passaic and Mars County submitted mosquitoes for Tripoli testing after the equine cases were reported, but none were positive for Tripoli. And uh, this northern activity is a, was a highly unusual distribution of Tripoli in New Jersey. So based on that unusual um, Tripoli activity in 2016, in early 2017, the Vector-Borne Disease Working Group uh, issued a joint press release from the Departments of Health, Environmental Protection, and Agriculture. Uh, each agency sent out messaging to their constituents and DEP expanded mosquito surveillance throughout the state. So looking back at uh, 2017, we, we tested a lot of mosquitoes. We identified 18 Tripoli positive pools, which was higher than 2016, but overall uh, still a pretty low year for Tripoli. In the chart on the left, uh, you can see that the 18 Tripoli positive pools were reported in eight counties, seven in the south and one in Monmouth County. There were no positive pools reported in the northern part of the state. Um, however, we did not get mosquitoes from every county in the north for testing. There were no human cases reported in 2017, and there were no specific requests for human Tripoli testing. Uh, but we did perform testing on over 30 specimens that were sent to CDC for Powassan testing, and uh, they were all negative for Tripoli. Uh, there were six Tripoli positive horses in 2017, which was higher than usual, um, and they were all in the southern part of the state. So looking at the map, the map on the left shows Tripoli activity for 2016 and the unusual activity patterns in the north. Uh, the counties with positive pools are shown in orange, equine cases are shown with the blue dots, and the human case is marked with a star. The map on the right shows uh, Tripoli activity for 2017, and you can see that the positive mosquito pools and the equine cases are all in the typical areas of the state. So overall, um, 2017 was a low year for Tripoli activity in mosquitoes. It was a high year in horse cases, but all of the activity was in the southern and central part of the state. Uh, we did have reports that in some of the northeastern counties last year, uh, there were reports of drought-like conditions that resulted in a lack of Pilocita melanora mosquitoes. Uh, the Vector-Borne Disease Working Group has reviewed the data from uh, 2017 and has decided to continue uh, enhanced surveillance for Tripoli throughout the state this coming season. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the travel-associated arboviruses that we have been seeing in New Jersey, specifically chikungunya, dengue, and Zika. Uh, so all three of these viruses are transmitted primarily by Aedes aegypti and potentially Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. And as a result, the geographic distribution patterns largely overlap. Um, so on this map, I just want to point out the red countries, which include most of the Americas, Southeast Asia, and several uh, West African countries. Um, these are the countries that have reported local trans locally transmitted cases of all three of these viruses. And unlike West Nile virus and Tripoli, where humans are considered dead-end hosts and unable to transmit the virus to other mosquitoes, chikungunya, dengue, and Zika are transmitted person-to-person -person via mosquitoes, and that makes them of increased concern in New Jersey. So as I mentioned, they're all three travel-associated viruses. They all share the same mosquito vectors. So looking at where these diseases are reported in New Jersey um, combined can help identify at-risk areas for targeting preventive education and surveillance. So from 2014 to 2016, um, again, looking at the incident rates for all three of these diseases combined, um, the highest rates are in Passaic, shown in black, Hudson, shown in purple, and then, um, and then the blue counties that are running along the northeast and the central part of the state. So dengue, chikungunya, and Zika share um, many clinical characteristics, but there are some clues that may point to one virus over another, and there's also certain concerning factors uh, with each disease. Um, starting with dengue, it's caused by one of four serotypes, and most infections are asymptomatic. The initial symptoms develop four to seven days after a mosquito bite, 
And apart from the nonspecific symptoms of fever, headache, muscle and joint pains, um, mild bleeding, such as a nosebleed, bleeding gums, or easy bruising is a clue uh, with dengue infections that can help distinguish it from other viruses. 5% of dengue infections will progress to a severe presentation in which the capillaries become leaky, allowing fluid to escape the blood vessels uh, into the abdominal cavity and the area surrounding the lungs, which can quickly lead to circulatory system failure and shock. If untreated, severe dengue has a 20% mortality rate, uh, which is reduced to less than 1% with proper clinical management. One of the concerns with dengue is that while infection confers immunity against the specific serotype, infection with one serotype actually increases the risk uh, that that person will develop a severe illness presentation if exposed to a second uh, serotype. The 2017 cases are shown on the map. It was a fairly low year with 598 total cases. Uh, New Jersey reported 21, which is slightly lower than our average. And uh, most of the travel associated dengue cases are reported between mid-July and early November each year. Similar to dengue, most Zika infections are also asymptomatic. Uh, symptoms develop three to 14 days after infection. And uh, among sort of the nonspecific symptoms, conjunctivitis is a symptom that is more likely seen with Zika infections as compared to other viruses. Severe illness and mortality are rare, but there have been reports of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome in areas with Zika infection. Zika is unusual, uh, of course, because it can be transmitted sexually and because infection during pregnancy can cause birth defects, including microcephaly. Uh, it's also been linked to poor pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriage and stillbirth. And although transmission has declined uh, worldwide, there are a large number of countries that are still at risk for Zika. Uh, this includes many popular vacation destinations and pregnant women are recommended to avoid travel to these areas uh, for the duration of pregnancy. Uh, infection with Zika is thought to confer lifelong immunity. And the map on the right is showing symptomatic cases for 2017. Uh, there were 433 total, 12 of which were reported in New Jersey, uh, and five were locally acquired between Florida and Texas. Uh, the chart on the left is showing the number of Zika cases reported in New Jersey, 2016 in blue and 2017 in orange. There were 200 less uh, reported cases in 2017, and you can see a seasonal increase during the summer months in both years. Testing has also decreased, looking at the chart on the right, uh, particularly after August 2017, when the testing criteria changed to routinely test only symptomatic persons. And in 2018, we um, have so far two cases, um, and the countries of exposure for those two cases are Cuba and India. In contrast to dengue and Zika, most persons infected with chikungunya are symptomatic. Uh, the incubation period is similar, three to seven days, as are several nonspecific symptoms. However, chikungunya patients usually have severe and debilitating joint pains, often in the wrist, the knees, the ankles, and the small bones of the extremities. Severe illness and death is rare, uh, but some patients will continue to have severe joint pain for months or even years after infection. And the 2017 Cases are shown on the map. New Jersey reported 10, uh, which is the fourth highest number after California, New York, and Texas. Okay, uh, moving to some emerging or potential arboviruses. Uh, I know this is a mosquito update, but I do want to mention Powassan because it is an arboviral disease. Uh, it's transmitted by uh, the same tick that transmits Lyme disease and anaplasmosis. We don't have as much <clears throat> information on Powassan since it is an emerging disease and testing for Powassan is only available at public health labs, um, so milder cases are likely underreported. The initial symptoms are nonspecific, uh, but persons can present with a severe neuroinvasive uh, presentation. And in those cases, half of survivors will have permanent neurological disorders and one in 10 persons will die of their illness, uh, which is a similar mortality rate as compared to West Nile. Powassan is a rare disease with an average of seven cases reported nationwide each year. However, due to considerable media coverage last spring, there was increased testing and a higher number of cases. 
The cases, as shown on the map, are concentrated in the north, northeast and upper midwestern parts of the country. Uh, this is a very similar distribution of where we tend to see Lyme disease cases. And in 2017, there were 31 cases reported, um, which is higher than our average of seven. And uh, four of those cases were in New Jersey, which is the third highest after Minnesota and New York. And uh, last year, we tested 33 uh, people for Powassan, and the four confirmed cases were all in the northern part of the state in Essex, Morris, and uh, two cases in Sussex. Jamestown Canyon and La Crosse viruses, um, these are closely uh, related orthopunia viruses. They are rarely reported. There were 67 cases of Jamestown Canyon and 44 cases of La Crosse reported in 2017. Uh, both of these can cause an acute febrile illness or a neuroinvasive presentation with meningitis or encephalitis. Jamestown Canyon tends to affect adults, and uh, there have been no deaths associated with Jamestown Canyon. La Crosse is reported primarily in children and is more likely to require hospitalization. Looking at the map uh, distributions, Jamestown Canyon uh, cases tend to be in the northeast and upper midwestern states. And traditionally, La Crosse cases were, were reported in the upper Midwestern states, but more recently, they're now reported from Mid-Atlantic and Southeastern states. So when you look at the distributions on the map and the location uh, where we are in New Jersey, there is a potential risk of infection with one or both of, of these viruses. On the mosquito testing side, uh, three counties tested for La Crosse virus in mosquito pools last season. There were no positives. And we aren't currently testing mosquitoes for Jamestown Canyon, but it is routinely found in both New York and Connecticut. And two more just to think about. Um, Usutu is an emerging flavi virus uh, with reports from several countries in Europe, reported initially in Austria in 2001. It is genetically related to the West Nile virus. Uh, it's a flavi virus, and it shares similar enzootic transmission cycle with birds as the amplifying hosts and bird-loving mosquitoes as the vector. Uh, Culex species appear to be the primary vector, but uh, Aedes albopictus may also be playing a role. It's been associated with high avian mortality in the blackbird population in Europe, and human cases were reported initially in Italy in 2009 and later in Croatia. The map at the top of the slide shows the spread of Asutu in Europe from 2002 to 2016. And uh, for this virus, better diagnostic tools are needed to detect this virus, and the risk of this virus to the United States is currently unknown. Uh, yellow fever uh, is an important arboviral disease, also flavivirus, uh, can be transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes in urban settings. It's endemic in much of Africa and South America. And uh, fortunately for this uh, virus, there is an effective vaccine. And massive vaccination campaigns in South America have largely prevented outbreaks um, in the Western Hemisphere over the past century. When local outbreaks occur, they're generally in rural parts of the country where forest-dwelling mosquitoes spread the virus to primates. But an increasing number of people have been infected in more populated areas in recent outbreaks in Brazil and Nigeria, which raises the risk of sustained person-to-person -person transmission. So moving on to some areas to focus on when investigating arboviral diseases. Um, as part of moving to the CDRSS um, 2.0, we have reviewed all of our signs and symptoms and have tried to standardize them uh, where we can. For most arboviral diseases, we are basically looking to characterize cases in terms of disease severity. Uh, we want to know if the person has a milder febrile illness or if there is a neuroinvasive presentation like encephalitis, meningitis, paralysis, et cetera. Um, so in the box, this is the list of default symptoms in either a Tripoli or West Nile virus case. And most vector-borne diseases will have an asymptomatic as an option because our case definitions do rely on the presence of clinical symptoms. And other symptoms can be added, same as in the current system. In addition to the symptoms, we want to know if the patient was hospitalized, the dates of admission, admission and discharge, and the patient's disposition, if they were discharged to home, if they were transferred to a rehabilitation facility, or if they died of their illness. Uh, for persons hospitalized with neuroinvasive illness, a lumbar puncture is often performed. Uh, in those cases, we would like the uh, CSF white blood cell count as well as the levels for protein and glucose. And this information is most useful if uh, we're going to be providing testing 
for arboviral disease either at FEL or at CDC. This is a really busy slide, uh, but uh, these are uh, the risk factors have also been slightly modified in CDRSS 2.0 and standardized across vector board diseases. So this is an example of the risk factors for dengue. We are very interested in determining if an arboviral disease is imported. Um, so as such, uh, the questions on travel have now been split into international and domestic travel. Um, there will be drop-down lists for the country or state, uh, respectively, in order to better capture that. And we have a specific question for relocation, also with a drop-down. We've added in time frames to better define relevant exposures. Um, so in this example, if someone traveled three months before, it would not be included as an exposure. Um, however, in the course of investigation, if there's no other exposure, I would definitely note that travel uh, three months before in the comments section. Uh, apart from asking about travel and relocation, the rare exposures we want to ask about are exposure through blood transfusion or organ transplant, exposure in either a healthcare or laboratory setting, and close contact with a known case. And uh, this last one would be very concerning in a dengue case without a travel or other exposure, um, because this would raise the level of concern that this could be uh, locally transmitted. In CDRSS uh, 2.0, we have the ability to ask disease-specific questions, and each uh, disease primary may choose to use this section in different ways, depending on the surveillance needs for that disease. For most of the vector-borne diseases, this section is used to capture information that we need to interpret laboratory tests or for data reporting requirements to CDC that don't really fit as a risk factor. Um, so this is an example of disease-specific questions for malaria. Uh, these questions include if the patient was previously diagnosed in the past year um, and the strain if known, uh, what the reason for travel was, which is a CDC reporting requirement, if the person took chemoprophylaxis to prevent malaria while traveling, and if so, what medication. And some diseases um, in this section will, have, uh, will be designated as CDS staff. Um, if you see this, uh, local health departments don't need to answer this question. So in this malaria case, the last question on the page is suspected local transmission. When we're reviewing the case, if there was no other known exposure after thorough investigation, because we would definitely want to make sure there's not a known exposure, uh, we would theoretically choose yes um, to suspected local transmission. So CDS staff will answer any of these questions. Uh, for many, arboviruses, testing is widely available at commercial labs, um, but for some diseases that are either rare or are emerging, testing may only be available at public health or specialty laboratories. Um, our testing currently is rather limited at FEL, but we can request testing at CDC. And if an arboviral disease is suspected and a clinician wants arboviral disease testing, we will certainly consider requests on a case-by-case -case basis, even for milder clinical presentations. Um, however, to prioritize resources, uh, when we reach out to clinicians this year through links uh, with an overview of arboviral diseases and procedures for testing, um, in general, we're going to be approving testing on patients hospitalized with encephalitis or other neuroinvasive disease presentation, where the likely causes have been ruled out, um, like West Nile or Etrovirus or herpes simplex, and an arboviral disease is suspected. Uh, we'll have an intake form for the clinician to complete, as well as the FEL SRD1 form, and these requests will come to CDS for approval. So in summary, uh, we do have a strong vector-borne disease surveillance system for the endemic diseases we see, like West Nile and Tripoli, that has allowed us to quickly adapt to the need for monitoring the emerging pathogens, such as the travel-associated diseases uh, like chikungunya, dengue, and Zika. Uh, there's definitely a need for improved laboratory diagnostics to identify these new pathogens. Uh, many of these diseases can only be tested for at a few public health labs, and we rely on physicians to be aware of rare viruses and to know how to seek out testing, which is challenging. Um, having a thorough investigation is needed to identify rare modes of exposure, to characterize the clinical presentations, and most importantly, to make sure that any travel-associated viruses don't become endemic in New Jersey. And finally, we have a very large foreign-born population. We're a highly mobile population in terms of international travel. And as such, uh, New Jersey will always be at higher risk for travel-associated diseases. So while an arbovirus may not currently be affecting the United States or New Jersey, it could be coming soon. 
and I'm going to provide just a few additional updates uh, from the Vector program. Uh, we have updated our mosquito-borne disease brochure. It's available online on our Vector-Borne Disease Illness page, and if you'd like printed copies of that, you can contact Krista Real. I put her email on the slide. And on the tick side of the shop, uh, we've posted an updated investigation chapter and worksheet for spotted fever group rickettsiosis on our website. We're going to be sending out messaging to clinicians this spring with information on some of the diagnostic challenges related to confirming a case and providing testing guidelines. We'll be working with a pilot group of physicians to collect specimens on suspected cases, and I will, we'll be sending out information on this separately. Um, from a local investigation standpoint, we would like to ask that when you do reach out to clinicians that you also provide the testing recommendations and specifically ask about convalescent specimens. Uh, and Karen Worthington from our uh, group will be providing you with some language that can be provided to physicians. Some exciting news in May. Uh, Governor Murphy has proclaimed May as Lyme Disease Awareness Month. Uh, we're excited about that and we'll be sending out information. And also on May 1st, uh, CDC will be issuing a vital signs report and an MMWR on vector-borne disease and how to reduce risks. Uh, which usually generates a lot of media attention and interest and can also help in increase uh, clinician awareness of vector-borne disease as well. Also in May, Rutgers University is partnering with county mosquito control agencies to conduct a one-day tick blitz. Uh, ticks will be collected across the state and identified and tested at Rutgers. Um, New Jersey doesn't have routine tick surveillance like we do with mosquito surveillance, so this is a great opportunity to, to collect some entomological data. And later in the month, uh, as Sharif had mentioned, we're partnering with Rutgers and the Monmouth County Tick Lab to offer a webinar on tick-borne disease. And in addition to including information on tick-borne disease in humans and educational resources, some other topics that you may not hear about normally include tick biology, life stages and habitat, and a summary of what we do know about ticks and pathogens in, in New Jersey. So hopefully you can uh, participate and register in that. And then finally, uh, I, there has been some news coverage about the uh, new tick in town, uh, Haemophysalis longicornis. Uh, it's an invasive exotic tick species from Southeast Asia. It was identified in 2017 in Hunterdon County. And we have recently, uh, in the fall, and we recently found out that uh, a tick collected in Union County in 2017 was also uh, identified as this particular species. We've discovered this spring that it has successfully overwintered in New Jersey, and um, it's also been identified on a deer um, in Hunterdon County. So uh, it definitely has been here for at least a year and uh, uh, perhaps is on the move. Uh, the tick is a known concern for livestock. Uh, it's been associated with several human diseases in Asia. Uh, we don't know what the impact of this tick is on human health in New Jersey. Testing that was performed on ticks and on a host animal last fall were negative uh, for human pathogens. Uh, CDS is collaborating with the New Jersey Department of Agriculture, which is the lead uh, agency for the response, the Department of Environmental Protection and Rutgers, uh, to determine where the tick is located um, within the state and to find out what the risks are for human health. Um, and for more information on that, the uh, New Jersey Department of Agriculture press release page has uh, two recent press releases that were posted in 2018, and there's also a fact sheet about the tick um, located on their homepage. And uh, with that, thank you very much. And I've listed um, the members of our vector-borne disease team, um, many, if not all of them, I'm sure you've worked with. And uh, we're just getting into our busy season along with DPOM on the food program and just appreciate everyone's uh, efforts to work with us on these reports. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, our next topic is uh, CDRSS 2.0, What You Need to Know. Uh, Jennifer Lowall, a health data analyst, will give you the presentation. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. I am Jennifer Lawal, MPH with the New Jersey Department of Health. I am in charge of CDRSS 1.0 and 2.0 training. And today I want to share some updates with you on the new system. Right now we are still working on testing and training for the CDRSS 1.0 redesign, which is now called CDRSS 2.0. We have also been going to various MCC centers across the state to host trainings in the morning and afternoon for three hour blocks, while also training other individuals through a recorded webinar accompanied with a live Q&A session. In the next few slides, I will elaborate on these trainings and some lessons learned. I will also open it up for any questions. So CDRSS 2.0 system update. CDRSS has been undergoing a system update including new enhancements, functionalities, and design to improve your workflow. The new version includes improved security technology updates, which includes a heightened password requirement and expanded device capabilities. So now you can view it on your iPad and your iPhone. So for training options for the 2.0, um, we have added a couple new users, but we want to do it for just current users. So these current CDRSS users must attend or complete one training session to ensure access to CDRSS 2.0. So we have trainings via webinar or in person. The webinar is a one hour pre-recorded session with live Q&A at the end where we answer any questions. We started it in March and we've added due to demand a couple more sessions for the end of May. So May 22nd, 23rd and 31st and June 5th and 7th. So these additional webinar dates for May and June will be posted on the CDRSS main page. We also, and I've encountered this while doing the trainings, we are having a separate webinar for the ILI surveillance. It's gonna be a five to 10 minute training video. So we actually do not require ILI users to come to the in-person trainings or do the one hour webinar. So the in-person trainings is what I've been busy with the last two to three weeks. Um, we've been doing two to three hour interactive sessions at MCC centers, and we're going to do a couple more in May as there's been an increased demand. So this has been throughout the month of April. And additional in-person trainings after the May dates can be scheduled upon request at New Jersey Department of Health in Trenton. If you have not attended or registered for either the webinar or in-person training, please sign up from the CDRSS main page. So as I mentioned, we have a couple remaining trainings um, for the webinars. The ones we currently have posted are all full. We have additional dates that are we're going to release in the next two days for May and a couple in June, and we'll schedule more if we feel we need to. So continue to check the main page. Um, in person, we have one in three in Newark, one tomorrow and two um, next week on Monday and Tuesday. So we have the training dates for April 27th, 30th, and May 1st. Um, because we are pushing back the go live date, we are also adding additional in person and we can have some on site in New Jersey, um, Trenton as well. So for new users needing access to CDRSS right now, we're still going to have them complete the training request and user agreement on the main CDRSS page. So as I did one today, I'm still doing the regular train the trainer for that or the webinars. And then they will also need 2.0 training. So they will need to register on the CDRSS main page for the current system. And they will also need to sign up for the webinar or the in-person trainings as well. And this is just gonna be in the interim until we go live. Okay, so a couple lessons learned, many lessons learned from the trainings. So general feedback, a lot of people find the new design visually appealing. Um, our current design is kind of 80s-esque, and there's a couple flasks on the main page, I think. But the new design, everybody really finds it visually appealing and user-friendly. Um, they like the streamlined functions. We've incorporated a lot of feedback from users on the functionalities we've added. And a lot of people, including especially lab users, um, find this very helpful. One complaint is um, widespread, too many clicks. So we're working on minimizing the number of clicks that everybody has to do. Um, and overall, a lot of users have, at the beginning of training, been very overwhelmed, but by the end have figured out that it was a lot easier than they thought, and they just need time to adjust to the new interface. Um, there are some complaints about the workplace limitations to access Google Chrome. You can use Firefox and Internet Explorer, 
but we've thoroughly tested Chrome and that's the browser we recommend. So we've told people to talk with their IT staff to get Google Chrome on their computers. And overall, people have felt that the design is very intuitive. Um, the, the overall layout is similar. It's just figuring out where everything is. Some of the favored functionalities, we have a toggle tool panel where you can add multiple columns. You can also filter columns when you have a pending cases search by location, uh, by disease. So a lot of people have really liked that toggle tool panel. Um, we now have a searchable database that encompasses almost all providers. By just searching the last name, it'll auto fill in the address and phone number. A lot of users really like that. It saves them time having to type in the provider each time. Um, person and case merges are much more visually appealing and easier in general. It does a side-by-side -side comparison and it makes it easy to decide whether or not you need to complete the merge. Some users were too afraid to do merges in the current system but now feel comfortable doing it in the new system. Um, we also have a lot of short uh, clip training videos that are posted under the resources section of the new system that go over each of the topics that we cover in the in-person and the webinar. So a lot of people feel like if there's a lag in time between their trainings that we've been hosting this week and when we go live that they'll definitely need to reference those to kind of refresh what they learned. Um, everybody really likes the fact that multiple people can be in one case at a time and we have section based saving. Um, we also have a tool that's recently viewed cases in the upper right hand corner, which is the five most recently viewed cases or ones that you've worked on or um, new cases and everybody really likes the reports function. And we're also going to create a video on reports as well. Any questions? We're going to do a poll question real quick. Okay. So the question is, how many of you have attended the CDRSS 2.0? All right, the question is, how many of you have attended the CDRSS 2.0? Oh, wow. Training. Training. <laughs> so we'll wait until we have most of the people. We have about 65% voting okay. so far. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, Jennifer. I hate to give you these results. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we're going to close the poll. Okay. And the results ooh, say um, C, 44% haven't been trained yet. All right. And 41% have watched the webinar, and 50% were in your in person in classes. So you have a few more things to <laughs> get. <laughs> So we have about 44% that still need to be trained. So definitely go on the CDRSS main page, those of you that have not been trained, and sign up for, in the next two days, we're going to post those new webinar dates. Um, and if you can make it to new work, you can still sign up for the next uh, Friday, Monday, Tuesday sessions in new work. We have morning and afternoon, um, three-hour blocks. I think it's, it's 9 to 12 and 1 to 4, um, Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. So if you can sign up for those and keep an eye out for the new in-person dates as this is very important in you being able to um, have access to the new system. All right, thank you. Any questions? We'll just put another at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any, any questions? Just put any in the question box. Any of the questions, box. we'll put in the question box and we'll just an I'll answer them at the end. Thanks, Jennifer. Again, if you guys have any questions, please type it down and we will try to answer all your questions at the end of uh, the next presentation, which is a case study, a case of Procella RB51 associated with raw milk consumption, uh, Kristen uh, Graflo, uh, zoonotic disease epidemiologist. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Gluaflo, and I'm the zoonotic disease epidemiologist at the State Health Department. And today I'll be discussing an investigation of a human case of Bucella abortus OB51 associated with raw milk consumption. Um, Brucella is a systemic infection caused by Brucella coca bacilli that can infect cattle, goats, sheep, pigs, and dogs, just to name a few. Worldwide, brucellosis usually occurs in geographic areas with large populations of these um, animal hosts. Human infections are most often associated with brucella militensis, 
Brucella suis, and Brucella abortus. Although brucellosis can be found worldwide, it's more common in countries that do not have effective public health and domestic animal health programs. Areas that are currently listed as high risk are the Mediterranean Basin, Mexico, South and Central America, Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. In the United States, flu cell infections are rare with about 120 human cases annually. This is largely due to a vaccination practices in cattle that this number is so low. Most of these cases are occurring people who have traveled to countries where brucella is more common and ingested contaminated milk or milk products, or had contact with infected animals. Among, um, among cases that do acquire brucellosis in the United States, infections generally occur from contact with feral swine or through accidental exposure in laboratory settings. Some brucella species indicated by asterisks on the slide are designated as select agents because of the potential to be developed as bioterrorism agents due to its ability to be aerosolized. So Brucella abrutus is a common cause of brucellosis in cattle. Brucella abrutus RB51 is a weakened strain of brucella developed specifically for immunization of cattle against brucellosis. To allow for serologic differentiation um, between naturally infected animals and vaccinated animals. Vaccinating cows with the RB51 vaccine helps prevent abortions in cows and reduces the risk of people coming in contact with cows that are infected with the more severe strains of Brucella. This vaccine was conditionally approved for use in cattle over the months of over the age of three months in 1996 and it should not cause clinical signs of disease in cattle. It usually flows from the bloodstream within three days, but in rare cases, vaccinated cows can shed OB51 in their milk. Accidental human exposure to OB51, though uncommon, has resulted in the development of clinical presentations consistent with brucellosis. These exposures have included needle sticks, eye and wound splashes, and contact with infected material. Other exposures include ingestion of raw or unpasteurized milk products from vaccinated cows and inhalation of organisms in laboratory settings. Brucella can be transmitted to humans in a number of ways. It can enter the body via inhalation, skin wounds, or mucous membranes. Transmission is commonly through consumption of undercooked meat from infected animals, unpasteurized or raw dairy products, or contact with infected animals. Clinical specimens containing these bacteria require specific handling to prevent inhalation of bacteria and therefore prevent laboratory exposures. Hunting can also be a risk for exposure and person person transmission is rare. Initial symptoms of brucellosis may be vague and may develop into severe disease if not treated. Symptoms of brucellosis may occur any time between five days to five months after the initial exposure, although the typical incubation period is between two to four weeks. Initial symptoms can include fever, sweats, malaise, anorexia, head pain, pain in the muscles, joints, and back, as well as fatigue. Symptoms may disappear for weeks or months, only to return at a later time. Those symptoms are listed here on the right-hand side of the screen, so they include um, fever, arthritis, testicular and scrotal swelling, endocarditis, neurologic symptoms, which is seen in up to 5% of all cases, chronic fatigue, depression, and swelling of the liver or spleen. Physicians caring for febrile patients who live in or have recently traveled to an endemic country should consider testing for brucellosis. When taking a patient history, inquiring about these activities related to risk factors of brucellosis can assist in more precisely assessing the risk of exposure. Questions on risk factors may include, do you work in a slaughterhouse or meatpacking environment? Have you recently traveled overseas? If so, where and when? While traveling, did you consume any undercooked meat or unpasteurized dairy products? If so, which products and how much of the products were consumed? Do you hunt? Have you recently had contact with animals? And do you work in the laboratory? And if so, do they, does your laboratory handle brucella specimens? Diagnosing brucella abortus OB51 can be really challenging. 
If you've previously investigated a case of brucellosis, you may be aware of the brucella microagglutination test or the standard tube of glut glutination test assay used to meet case definition. So this assay is able to detect most brucella species. However, brucella avoidus OB51 cannot be used, cannot be detected using those serologic methods. Confirming brucella avoidus OB51 infection must be done through PCR or cultures. A febrile patient that has recently consumed raw milk from a vaccinated dairy cow or who may have been exposed to OB51 in other ways, providers should consider brucella avoidus OB51 as a possible diagnosis and order the proper tests. Healthcare providers ordering blood cultures for patients with suspected brucellosis should advise the laboratory that brucella is, is suspected, so appropriate laboratory precautions are followed to prevent accidental inhalation of the organism by laboratory staff. So let's take a look at a 2017 investigation of a human case of brucella abortus early 51. In late September of 2017, um, the State Health Department was notified by the Minnesota Department of Health of a specimen from a New Jersey resident that, test, that was tested at a commercial laboratory in Minnesota. This specimen tested preliminarily positive for brucella abortus. Once we received that notification, we then notified the local health department where the patient resides and the hospital where the patient was receiving care. And we also entered the laboratory results in CDSS. The hospital laboratory was instructed to develop a line list of all employees in the lab when the specimen was being manipulated. Line lists help us ensure that all person, persons potentially exposed to the organism are contacted to complete a risk assessment questionnaire. The local health department immediately conducted a patient interview to identify the patient's signs, symptoms, and possible risk factors for brucellosis using the New Jersey Department of Health brucellosis investigation worksheet. So this is just a brief snapshot of the timeline for confirmation of the isolate. So as you can see um, on September um, 28th, we received the presumptive positive um, from Minnesota of brucella. And then upon identification, the isolate was then forwarded to the CDC for confirmation and some additional testing. And CDC was able to confirm that um, this was indeed a brucella abortus early 51. And additional findings from molecular testing showed that the isolate wasn't related to a strain of OB51 implicated in a recent Texas outbreak earlier in the year. And that this isolate was indeed resistant to the fampin, which is very common and what we expect to see with an RB51 strain brucella. So here's the um, Department of Health Brucellosis webpage. In June of 2017, we uploaded a brucella um, investigation worksheet. So this worksheet contains information on the patient's demographic, clinical information, risk factors, and treatment. It's not meant to be faxed to healthcare providers, but may act as a guide during a healthcare provider or patient interview. Um, so the local health department interviewed the patient using that brucellosis investigation worksheet and gathered some very helpful information. It was determined that the patient developed nonspecific symptoms consistent with brucellosis, such as fever, chill, neck pain, and a headache in mid-September. In terms of risk factors for infection, the patient did not travel internationally, nor did she have contact with potentially infected animals. However, she did consume 4.5% raw cow's milk from Aru Milk, a home delivery company that we learned had illegally sold and distributed unpasteurized milk in New Jersey. The patient consumed small quantities, just using it in her coffee, and her other family members were the primary consumers of the raw milk. Since people who consume raw milk or raw milk products that are potentially contaminated with OB51 are at high risk for brucellosis infections, symptom monitoring and post-exposure prophylaxis for the patient's three family members were critical interventions. They saw the healthcare provider and received post-exposure prophylaxis um, for three weeks and symptom watched for six months. The patient was treated with antibiotics for 60 days. 
Now let's take a look um, at the um, investigation into the potential laboratory exposures um, in the New Jersey hospital. But before we start, let's begin with a poll question. Sure. Hold on. <laughs> okay, so which tests are able to detect Brucella abortus or the 51? Is it the Brucella species IgM assay, PCR, culture, both B and C, or all of the above? Please vote. responding and the survey says oh looks like they got it right 54% said both B and C oh excellent so 54% of you got the correct answer which is both B and C like I said diagnosing Brucella bullitus or 51 infections can be really challenging since we can't use the routine serologic testing such as the IgM assay. Um, so both PCR and culture can be done to um, detect the specific strain of all of these 51. Of course, the menu said all the above. Oh, but I hear many of you said all of the above. So, you know, at least some of you recognize that PCR and culture are available. But again, um, for not all of these 51 strains, you can use that IgM assay. Okay, so let's take a look at um, what the state health department did um, in terms of looking into laboratory exposures. So as I've mentioned previously, human exposures to brucella can happen in laboratory settings. Brucellosis is actually the most commonly reported laboratory associated bacterial infection. So a number of factors can contribute to the risk of accidental brucella exposures. So some of those include lack of experience working with that organism, um, was performed on an open bench and not under BSL fluid conditions, which is required for brucella handling. Um, use of inadequate personal protective equipment when handling brucella specimens, or unknown or identified samples that arrive for analysis. Certain characteristics of this bacterium, such as its low infectious dose and ease of aerosolization, can contribute to the risk of infection by the organism in laboratory settings. Receipt of an unknown or unidentified sample can cause laboratorians to perform work on a specimen outside of the necessary biosafety laboratory conditions for the organism that is identified. So this is an example of why it's really important that healthcare providers um, alert the receiving laboratory if Brucella is suspected in a clinical specimen. When an exposure does occur, um, determining if the exposure, if the risk is high or low, is really the first step. <laughs> so broadly, um, lab workers considered at high risk are those who worked within a five-foot radius of the activities associated with the specimen, or any workers present in the room when aerosol-generating procedures took place. Low-risk lab workers are any people that are present at a distinct greater than five feet from the specimen. So in this investigation, the possibility of brucellosis wasn't initially a part of the differential diagnosis. And the culture was first actually ident identified as a gram-positive organism, and brucella is a gram-negative organism. So um, because of this, the laboratory staff manipulated the culture extensively outside of a biosafety cabinet. So all 17 lab workers were characterized as having high-risk exposures. So this slide um, describes the post-exposure prophylaxis and monitoring recommendations for those with brucella exposures. 
we have the RUB51 recommendations on the right hand side and non rb 51 on the left. So um, the differences in recommendations are underlined, as you can see. The main distinction is that for non rb 51 blue cell exposures, um, post exposure prophylaxis routinely consists of a combination of doxycycline and levampin, as well as sequential serologic testing um, for early detection of infection. However, since we know RB51 is resistant to levampin, um, those with exposure to RB51 should receive doxycycline and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for the 21 days. Um, currently, there is no human serologic test available for monitoring RB51 exposures, making symptom monitoring a really important step of early detection of infection. For those at high risk, PEP is recommended, and for those with low risk exposures, um, they may opt to take the um, PEP regimen. It's also recommended that all persons symptom monitor for six months after their last exposure. Monitoring should include active or daily temperature monitoring, as well as passive symptom monitoring for those broader symptoms of brucellosis. So in this investigation, all 17 lab workers were considered high risk and took post-exposure prophylaxis for 21 days, um, as well as monitored flu symptoms for six months, which just ended this past month. So now let's take a look at the investigation into the company of Udder Milk. Well, the local health department was doing an investigation related to the case patient Multiple programs at the state health department were concurrently conducting investigations related to utter milk in conjunction with various state agricultural agencies in the northeastern United States and with federal agencies, including FDA and USDA. We mainly learned about utter milk from um, customer reports and from limited information on the company's website. The sale of raw milk and distribution is illegal in New Jersey, and it's also illegal to sell raw milk across state lines. Utter Milk describes itself as a co-op on wheels, and it distributes milk in multiple states. It operates as a members-only company, and you actually need to apply and be approved by Utter Milk before you can place an order. Utter Milk provided drop-off um, in public locations, as well as provided direct to home delivery. There's limited information on where the raw milk and raw milk products were actually coming from. Other milk doesn't list a physical address on the website, only a cell phone number and an email address. And we're not able to obtain information on what forms are providing milk to other milk. So we still have not yet been able to identify the possible sources of the OZ51 contamination. Among the actions that the state health department initiated, a cease and desist order was issued to Utter Milk. After the issuance of the cease and desist, it appeared Utter Milk moved the regular pickup sites that were in public locations to unannounced members' addresses and only seemed to be delivering directly to consumers' homes, making it very difficult to monitor. So let's discuss public notification. In routine foodborne disease outbreak investigation, generally in public health, we will have more information on the potential source of exposure. This information allows us to provide more targeted information about possibly contaminated food sources. And we're able to do tra tracebacks with FDA or USDA on the distribution of these contaminated food sources so that consumers will have more specific information on these products. Unfortunately, in our investigation, we were not able to get information on the raw milk company, Utter Milk, such as customer lists, lists to conduct surveillance for illnesses, or what farms provided milk to the company, so we could try to identify which cows may have received the RB51 vaccine. Since we could not um, obtain information and reach out directly to Utter Milk customers, and we were concerned about the contaminated products still might be distributed, we decided to issue a press release and several health alerts to local health departments and health care provi providers to advise them of the situation and to be alerted for brucellosis cases. And of course, to report any suspect ca cases immediately to public health. 
Subsequently, the CDC and FDA issued similar press releases, in addition to New York and Rhode Island, given that reports of other milk distributions were found in those states as well. After the press releases went out and media outlets quickly picked up the story, we were on alert for additional cases, um, any additional case reports, and any additional information that we could use to gather more information on other milk. To date, we've received two reports um, of two families that consumed raw milk from other milk. So in December, we received a notification by a healthcare provider whose pediatric patient presented with a mild headache after consuming other milk. The patient's brother also consumed other milk, but was asymptomatic. The family had consumed other milk for years, and the, child, the two children consume about a half to one gallon of raw milk per week. So the, um, <clears throat> we recommended that the physician order blood cultures or order PCR for diagnosis as serologic assays or unable to detect OB51. However, um, the physician ended up ordering serology for both children and placed them on antibiotics. So as we know, these serologic um, test results came back negative as we would expect since we know that that IgM assay is unable to detect the OB51. Um, and since the children were already placed on antibiotics, additional specimens were not obtained. So um, it, the provider ended up telling the children to self-monitor for symptoms for six months. The second family saw a health care provider in January of 2018. Um, and this is a little bit different because um, there was a large gap from when they actually consumed the milk to when they sought health care. So you can tell that this was um, definitely a response to seeing the media messages about udder milk um, as well as some of our health alerts. So they consumed udder milk between March and April of 2017. Um, and then four of the family members, the mother, two children, and the children's grandmother who cares for them at home, developed symptoms consistent with brucellosis, but back in May of 2017. The local health department conducted, in, conducted interviews um, for the four patients to gather more information on their symptoms, consumption history, and any information on other milk ordering and delivering practices that they were willing to provide. <coughs> it was determined that um, all four patients had fever, sweats, malaise, headache, and fatigue, three had loss of appetite, Two had muscle pain and elevated liver enzymes, and one had um, lingering arthritis back in 2017. And these symptoms continued to linger. Um, there was one designated family member that placed all udders with udder milk online, and um, she was able to give us a little insight into udder milk. Um, she stated that once she um, places the order, it would take approximately two days to receive it and they were placed um, left outside of her house in a cooler. Um, once the products were received at the home, they were consumed by the family members but within five to seven days. Um, the local health department um, did a really good job and requested any remaining product or product containers um, just to give us more information on the actual products. However, they were no longer available. I uh, just want to jump back. I forgot to mention that in addition to the patient interview, um, we did collect whole blood specimens um, on those four symptomatic individuals, and they were tested at the New Jersey Department of Health Bio Threat Response Laboratory. Um, and all four specimens tested negative for Brucella by PCR, um, which was kind of expected since the onset of symptoms was really um, all the way back in May. Um, but um, we did forward those specimens to CDC and they repeated the PCR and it was negative and they cultured it out and it was still negative. So in all, we haven't identified any additional brucellosis cases um, related to the other milk investigation. However, it's still important for those of us in healthcare and public health to help address the issue of raw milk consumption by encouraging education on the many risks associated with raw milk, as brucellosis is only one of the many infections that can be caused by raw milk consumption. 
And in New Jersey, we have to remember that the sale and distribution of the raw milk is not only risky, it's illegal. Um, so let's just continue to work together to prevent potentially serious infections. Thanks, Kristen. That was really interesting presentation. Uh, if you guys have any questions, we have uh, 20 minutes to uh, answer your questions. So please go ahead, type your question, and we have all the smart brains and the expertise to answer all the difficult questions that you may have. All right, so Dipam will answer the first question that we got. So I'm back again. Um, the question that we got for um, the food bond presentation is, is it likely that we will not see any more STEC cases related to this outbreak in New Jersey? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> the quick answer really is we do not know for sure. Um, so like I mentioned um, during my slides, we've been seeing an increase with our STEC cases. So just to present the New Jersey picture, uh, we've been monitoring our cases about since March 12th. Um, and we're at approximately 50 cases. So this 50 number is anything that gets reported through CDRSS. So it could be a CIDT positive, which would never have uh, a specimen that ends up at 12. It could be a PCR or an isolate, which would get forwarded. Of these, some of them are non-viable, test negative, um, perhaps due to poor quality specimens sometimes. Um, some get ruled out as non o 157s So unless there's a specimen truly to get to the state lab that gets there in good shape, um, gets matched by PFG, it doesn't get added to the cluster. Even as I speak, there are cases that are being added to the national cluster. Um, and typically with foodborne clusters, based on the illness onsets, there's a reporting lag that you tend to see because all of these need to match, so the specimen needs to get first tested at the facility, then to the state lab, matched, get uploaded onto CDC, and that's when it becomes a true match to this cluster. That's almost an average of two to three weeks. And we have illnesses um, that could have occurred after April 5th that have still not been reported. So could New Jersey still see cases? Yes, we very well could. Um, and there are still cases um, nationwide. Um, just to uh, quickly uh, give an idea of the, the growing season, it seems like we get our product between uh, winter and Easter. Um, that's when we receive letters typically from the Yuma region, so it probably has shifted, um, but you never know. I hope that answered the question. If not, shoot me an email and I'll try to answer it better. All right, and then we have two questions about CDRSS. Or Thanks, Dipam. Jennifer um, uh, is going to answer a couple of questions for you. Hi, everyone. So the first question is, I took the webinar and I tried to use the training site, but it never works. Um, so for this type of problem, please contact the CDRSS help desk. The link is on the main page and we can try to figure out exactly what is going on with the training site for you. It could be username, password issue. The next question is, are there any problems with the 2.0 training site? Um, there's been a few bugs we found in the trainings, but overall there will always be bugs with any new system. But we have a running list and are working on getting them fixed, whether they're urgent or in later phases. What is the go live date for CDRSS 2.0? I knew this would be a question. <laughs> Currently, we do not have a go live date and recommend you continue to check the CDRSS main page. We will send out an email to all users when we have determined the exact date. And then the um, last question is, if multiple people can be in the case at the same time, can they both edit? Both people can edit, but the way that it works is it's locked section by section. So for instance, if I go into a section someone is in, it will tell me that it's locked and then it will give their username. You, I will only see that section as read only. But once that person's out of that section, I can go in once they're out and they've saved or they've canceled out of it. Any major changes to the case while you are in it will be a pop-up alert. So if somebody goes into the case and changes an address, it'll tell you that the address has been changed. 
And is there a concern about confusion since multiple people can be in the case at the same time? Um, as I've seen in training, there aren't going to be a ton of people practicing in one case at a time, so I don't think there will be a lot of confusion. Keep in mind that cases are limited to your jurisdiction, so only certain people have access to cases. If you could see all cases in the state, then this would be more of an issue, but I don't see this being a concern as you have the read-only view still, and it gives you alerts when people update information. All right, that's great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you so much for making time and attend our webinar today. We hope that you, oh, I, I, I personally learned a lot today, so I hope that you guys. One more question before we. <laughs> there <laughs> so why can you why are you getting the out of jurisdiction mm -hmm. message um this can depend on your viewing privileges we set your viewing privileges when we set up your account so if you're getting out of jurisdiction it could be correct that you actually cannot be this case because you don't have access to that um, geographic area um, but this would also be something where you contact the help desk with the case ID and we'll ascertain whether or not it's a case that you should be able to view Thank you again. Uh, hopefully that uh, you, you guys, you will, don't, for, don't forget that you're gonna get the uh, evaluation link uh, and this should be answered in five days before it closes so you can get your uh, CEUs. I also hope that you go and register for our next webinar on July 12th. And I'm hoping to see you all in person when we do the in-person training uh, this coming fall. Thank you so much. Have a great day, and we will be talking to you soon. Thank you. Thanks.